most of um, literature and films that describe a utopian scenario are kind of creepy. So if you really look closely, this utopian world is not good. It's also a dystopia. And that's sometimes overlooked. And that has been widely discussed in literature, literature critique. But utopia can very quickly turn. Discover thought-provoking exhibits that interrogate technology through art with Marley's Worth, the curator for digital culture and head of the design collection at the MAC, the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna, Austria. As a curator and art historian, Marley's explores the cultural, social, ecological, and political impacts of the digital age and the role of art and design in reimagining our relationship with the planet. Exhibits Marley's has curated and that we discuss in today's episode include Artificial Tears, Hello Robot, Design Between Human and Machine, Uncanny Values, Artificial Intelligence and You, Pardon Our Dust, Imagine, A Journey into the New Virtual, and Edging. Each explores technology's impact on society and culture beyond their surface design which is a lifelong passion and pursuit of Marley's, who also regularly takes part in international lectures, talks, and juries on art, design, and digitalization. Alongside her institutional work, she also develops independent exhibition projects with international artists and writes essays and texts for publications. I'm a proud member of the Austrian Chamber of Commerce Bold Community, which brings people together across disciplines who are shaping the future and was connected to Marley's through another bold member, Latte Christofersk. In today's conversation, Marley's discusses the relationship between humans and machines and what makes us uniquely human, like our tears, which can't be automated. We also explore singularity, identity play in immersive environments, and the need to address corrupt human data, which can lead to issues like racial bias and crime prediction. Join the conversation as Marley's reflects on the profound impact of digital technologies on culture, such as how the iPhone and social media have fundamentally changed how we interact with the physical world. Enjoy. Welcome to Creativity Squared. Discover how creatives are collaborating with artificial intelligence in your inbox, on YouTube, and on your preferred podcast platform. Hi, I'm Helen Todd, your host, and I'm so excited to have you join the weekly conversations I'm having with amazing pioneers in the space. The intention of these conversations is to ignite our collective imagination at the intersection of AI and creativity to envision a world where artists thrive. Well, Marley's, it is so good to have you on Creativity Squared. Welcome. Thank you so much, Helen, for having me. Yeah, it's so great uh, to have you on the show. Uh, Marley's and I got uh, connected through um, uh, the Austrian Chamber of Commerce, uh, Latte, who was at the um, the Bold Unconference. And soon she heard about the podcast. She's like, oh my gosh, you have to meet Marley's. She's the curator of digital culture and the head of the Mac Design Collection at Mac Vienna, which is the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna. And we're in for a treat today because Marley's has done so many amazing curation and exhibitions. Um, but for those who are meeting you for the first time, can you kind of share a little bit more about about who you are, what you do, and your origin story. <laughs> yeah, that, I can do that. So, um, as you said, my name is Marlies. I was born and raised in Austria, in Lower Austria. Went to Vienna to study art history, um, which has ever since fascinated me. But I soon learned that I want to work with contemporary art and contemporary design, uh, like with the living and the contemporary culture also of digitalization and of yeah the problems we are facing today. So I'm um, more than happy to work at the MAC, the Museum of Applied Arts, that holds a vast um, a majority of historic collections, but also to contemporary ones, contemporary art, and the collection that I'm heading, design and digital culture. Amazing. Well, it's so good to have you on the show. And for those who aren't familiar um, with the MAC Museum, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, MAC um, and kind of the, the philosophy of the museum as well? Yeah, so the Museum of Applied Arts was founded in the 19th century 
It has a, a historic building on a Stubenring in the center, in the heart of Vienna. And it, uh, its collections are divided by materials, which is very special, um, based on a system defined by Gottfried Semper, um, the architect and, and theoretician of the 19th century. And so uh, for, to ensure that the materials are stored and conserved and researched properly, it was divided into like glass, porcelain, textiles, wood, uh, metal, and um, others. And then later on, we started adding uh, to these collections materials that might um, not be co have been common in the past, but are now, such as digital productions or installations or uh, even yeah, uh, plastic and, and uh, it's synthetic materials that have not been in existence in the past. And what we do, um, apart from showcasing our collection, is uh, focusing very much on societal topics, like um, topics that um, engage with what uh, is, is uh, a grappling theme of our common society right now in our global world. And these are topics such as digitalization, the use of technology, the way that our use of the internet or technology is changing culture as well, and the way we perceive originals or even exhibitions and artworks. And I am um, especially in the Department of Design and Digital Culture, I'm looking at uh, creatives all over the world, artists, designers, and architects who are always the avant-garde when it comes to using technology and, and digital tools. And I'm looking what they are doing with um, these and um, how they are being critical about um, digitalization. Yeah, I love that. And I know you're friends with uh, Gerfried Stalker at Ars Electronica. And one thing that he said in our interview is art is such a great tool to interrogate some of these things. And I, I feel like your exhibitions have really interrogated a lot of societal themes. Um, and I know, like, even though AI has really with... Um, ChatGPT and generative AI has really captured mainstream attention this year. You all have been playing in this space for a while. And one of the first exhibitions I'd love to uh, hear you talk about is the Artificial Tears, Singularity, and Humanness a Speculation. And that was back in 2017. Uh, so can you kind of tell us what the inspiration was for this and a little bit of the, um, uh, yeah, set the scene for us about this exhibition? That's such a wonderful project. I'm so happy that you chose to to want to talk about it. It's been a while, but it's uh, still a topic that's close to my heart. So back then, um, we were starting to work on a large-scale traveling exhibition titled Hello Robots, designed between human and machine, that was uh, co curated with the Vitro Design Museum and the Design Museum Ghent. And in the course of that, um, the MAC and also especially my department were concerned with the research about automation and what that means for us humans, like automating our labor, automating certain processes that we used to do ourselves. What does it mean for creativity, etc.? So um, next to this um, Hello Robot exhibition, which was a large uh, international corporation, I decided I have to have a look into yeah, humanness as a word or the human condition and really um, try and, and gather a bunch of artists who have been um, poetically observing little quirks and little things that we human do or have, which is very special because we must not forget when we compare ourselves all the time to machines, um, like this trope of um, I'm not functioning properly today or something like that. Um, our bodies and minds are such a great system. It's even like more intricate than any technology that's uh, been invented. So I wanted to look at that um, somehow and also at the question, what can and cannot be automated? And there's this funny thing, I think it's more popular in the US actually, artificial tears, like the little liquid that you can use to, to moisture your eyes if they are dry or itchy. And that's something where, where I read, it's, it's not the same as actually having tears in your eyes because the chemical composition of tears is different depending on the reason why you cry them. And I was so fascinated by that thought and it's really you can look it up it's scientifically proven um because uh, tears that you cry out of physical pain contain like little parts of opioids to calm the body and to heal you and also the act of crying we see it much in, in babies and children but also as adults it's like a physical effort so you get exhausted so you calm down and you shut down and it's calm it's a natural system to calm you so crying is an act that's very necessary it can't be automated so you can't just put little drops in your eyes and done, be done with it. And yeah, that was kind of the, the back story of, of 
how I, that show came about. And the works that I showed were very different in nature, but coming from, for example, film props by Dora Budor, um, till um, artificial scents um, by uh, John Rusbett, um, but also, yeah, objects that show something that only humans can do, such as like hallucinating or um, having a gut feeling, because we must not forget, not only the brain thinks and feels and works for us, also this other organ um, where microorganisms actually live within us, other species basically, um, is also something that tells us about what's right or wrong or intuition. So that has been um, uh, an interesting thought where you can say that, yeah, not only intelligence is the defining nature of humans, although we claim to be the most intelligent species, but we have to combine it with emotion and with embodiment, which is so important because, as we know, the machine um, does not have other organs that also can hold memory. And that's another interesting thought that I had about this, yeah, what can be automated and what not. Is like memory. We call it also the memory drive on machines and computers, so we can save stuff that can be remembered. Um, but we humans have a very different way of remembering things. So um, we always, again, try to compare ourselves to machines. And so, yeah, you have to, your files in your brain somehow. Not true, because there's also things you don't actually like remember, but your body knows where to turn right on the way to your, I don't know, your mother's house or something like that. Or you recognize a certain smell and then uh, memories come back because uh, the organ of smelling, uh, like an olfactory sense, suddenly triggers memory. Machines are not capable of having this like multifaceted complex process. It's just serious and ones. So yeah, that was basically the, the underlying um, thought of the exhibition. Well, and one thing that you had said before we started recording is that... Um, in the, what is it, after the Cold War and in the 60s, we compared humans to machines, and now we're uh, comparing machines to humans. So I was wondering if you could kind of expand on that, because I thought that was like a, an interesting observation of our relationship with machines right now, too. Absolutely right. It's lovely that you brought that up. Um, yeah, because we thought we can have like spare parts for humans. I mean, especially the Cold War era and this time was obsessed with new machinery. Um, there was also in, in the film industry a rise of films that had intricate machinery, time machines or portals or tech that could take us somewhere um, in a, like a parallel universe and things like that. So we were always obsessing over the machine, helping us expand our capabilities, which it kind of does. I mean, um, yes, but we were also comparing the bodies to machines. Um, as I said earlier, the memory is one thing, but also body parts, like you can have processes and just if the hand falls off, you get a new one. And it's not that easy. I mean, we, we are lucky that we have this kind of medical advancements, but um, the, yeah, the, the holistic thought of how a body works and how humans are also interconnected through also microbes and the exchange of certain information that is beyond talking or um, yeah, intelligent conversation is uh, not to be compared with machines. And now, um, as you said, we are switching that off and only because there's natural language processing, which means, okay, it's, it has the resemblance of sentences and grammar and speech pattern that we humans um, do. Um, it is not human. And you mentioned ChatGPT earlier. So that's um, it's very advanced in a way that it responds much better than maybe like 10 years ago, the early chatbots where you clearly could see um, and feel and that that was not a human, so it would not pass the uh, Turing test, but now it's still something that's only learned on, base, uh, on the basis of data, on databases, on things that exist. So it can't have an original thought, because to have a thought, you would have to have the concept of a mind. And then again, the machine does not have that. Um, it recalls memory and data from storage. And one thing in the um, in the explanation of the show on the website is um, one of the um, elements of the exhibition is interrogating singularity, which you kind of alluded to a little bit of um, machines not having minds, but uh, the futurist uh, Ray Kurzweil 
it's kind of predicting with singularity that we're going to see that in our lifetime. So I was like curious um, how, uh, yeah, interrogating singularity came out in the exhibition as well. Yeah, the singularity defined by Ray Kurzweil is um, the concept of us and machines basically merging to be one entity, uh, non-human, more vastly powerful because combining all knowledge of humanity and machines alike. And it's actually kind of like a science fiction concept. So there's many scientists out there who are claiming that this would not actually work. And uh, it's, it's a theory or like a theoretic concept, but that's vastly different from stuff that we can pull off even like with the software and hardware that's at hand for the next 50 years to be predicted. I'm not an expert on, on tech hardware, but um, we, we saw that um, also in, in the times of Alan Turing, who was an expert on machi machine learning in the 1950s already, that the computing power was just not enough. He had invented a chess computer way back then, but it wouldn't work because, yeah, the, the power wasn't there. Now with quantum computers being developed, um, the thought is interesting, but still, why would that happen? So, um, yeah, many scientists find the singularity highly unlikely. But if we would take it in for a moment as a, a basis for this exhibition, um, that would mean, uh, yeah, the minds of humans and machines merging and it's being like a godlike kind of holistic being that knows everything and has access to every feeling and um, information in the world. And that has been compared to drugs, actually. And one specific one is called DMT. And it's like um, a, a, a substance that occurs in nature. And I have been told, didn't try it myself, that it creates some kind of the best and most connected feeling with the universe and all beings that you will ever know. Lasts only very shortly. And the artist Jeremy Shaw, um, did uh, work on that. It's called DMT. It's from 2004. He did that as an experiment with um, some fellow artists and friends. And what we showed in the exhibition was this piece. It's um, the faces of the people on little screens. So um, it's also like the human likeness, but represented by a machine body. As they try to describe what they see and feel while having this experience. And that seems to like describe a little bit what Ray Kurzweil is thinking, like this um, massive feeling of being one singular organism and train of thought with all the machines in the singularity. That's so fascinating. So the, um, if I understand what you said correctly, the altered state as related to our consciousness being connected to oneness is like what Kurzweil is saying is singularity with the help of machines that will be able to achieve that with without psychedelics. Is that is that correct? Exactly. Through connecting with the machines. That's so fascinating. Well, there was one. Um, uh, well, it's actually from another exhibit that I wanted to uh, read. Um, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but uh, we're going to talk about um, an avatar uh, a little down mm -hmm. the line. But one of the points in the exhibit, and this is an excerpt, uh, is, uh, is it kind of talks about uh, eternity and whatnot, which we'll, we'll get to is um, the poem is, or the little excerpt from the poem is, is this right now? Is this yesterday? Today, tomorrow, forever, never had I been. I had always been. I will always be. I can see this room, every room at once, recollected. And I feel like that kind of captures that of uh, everything all at once, or what is the name of the movie? Everything, everywhere, all at once, or something. <laughs> kind of capturing that right. uh, that sentiment. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great take that you have there to to combine that because Laturbo Avedon is a very interesting character. Um, they are a digital avatar, an artist and curator, and I've invited them to have the solo show Partner Dust at Mac in uh, 2022. And as a digital being, not being embodied in a physical world, um, Laturbo Avedon has access to this kind of different way of thinking about. Um, the singularity and the ways that you can be connected and every you can be in the past, in the present, the future, and everywhere at once as an avatar online. 
we can do that too. So our likenesses of our Instagram accounts or TikTok or <laughs> Facebook accounts are out there as we are here at the same time in this uh, software. So um, as a digital presence or digital image, as we know, we can be anywhere. And that captures that sentiment very much. And the avatar is basically a representation of us online as a digital creature. And it comes actually from Sanskrit being like a, a god um, come, coming down to, to earth and representing in, in a human shape. And we use that word to be represented in a yeah, digital code um, on, on the internet. I find that so fascinating, especially since, well, one, I think I told you I've, I've digitally cloned myself with a hyper-realistic avatar, and I think we're just going to see more and more of these, but For beyond sure. even uh, the type of clone that I have, there's already the tech out there to have more interactive um, clones where you can feed your own data to it, and so not only mm-hmm. is it uh, a digital likeness that looks like you, but it can respond in your voice based on your own data and IP. So what does that mean uh, in the relationship to this other entity that looks like me, sounds like me, and is based on my uh, my data and IP uh, as far as our relations of representation and whatnot? So I think it's going to get super interesting really quickly on that front. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's so interesting that Um, This is starting right now because humanity has dreamed of that. I'm always jokingly saying, where's my clone at when we have stressful exhibition installation periods where we would need some more of me. Um, But um, now it's being real, at least online, and we can send our digital representation, for example, to a talk or giving a lecture. If we feed the data in correctly, that digital avatar could actually give a lecture somewhere while I'm doing the podcast with you. So that um, is the next step of automation that's going to be very interesting. And what I also think is it might help uh, humans to rethink uh, yeah, a sense of self. We are all kind of sometimes struggling with that. Um, and um, especially people who are not happy with their like embodied um, presence or have yeah different gender fluidity and, and things like that. I think it's really helpful and interesting um, to use this avatar to trying to find one's personality and then maybe some people change in real life too to resemble more the likeness of the avatar that they've created and designed for themselves so i think that's a really interesting topic yeah well even if you take just instagram how people Mm. uh, have more of their ideal lives like are you taking this photo because it's actually a scene that's authentic to your life or an idealized scene that you want to capture and show on Instagram of like this more idealized life that you're striving for. Uh, But one thing I was thinking the other day that I think one of the futures of play might be identity play. So you have your avatar and you can play with it, um, maybe at different genders, different uh, scenarios. Um, and it looks like you, sounds like you, but yeah, in, in a way that uh, without the constraints of time and space in our physical worlds, uh, get to explore some of that identity more, which I think is a kind of interesting thing with the, the metaverse and all these immersive experiences with avatars and whatnot. Definitely. And um, you're also saying like identity plays kind of, already going on a lot in in virtual computer games right so you have world building you have whole different dynasties and worlds and scenarios that are far from real in these fantasy kind of games and you can insert yourself there uh, with your avatar and be these characters and play out these different lives in different eras and and periods of uh, or regions of the world so that's already um in full bloom and the gaming industry is also really really touching on culture and coming closer a lot because it's becoming more interesting also to artists and designers to design these worlds and to engage with these topics and use game engines, which are super high tech um, feed, uh, software to, to create these worlds that are large and, and have to change and be online for multiplayers. So that's um, sparking a new interest of, of the art scene as well. That's amazing. And I heard some stat the other day that the actual gaming industry makes so much more money than uh, TV and film. So I I don't have that stat, but it wasn't surprising to me just because of the immersive uh, way that you interact with games. 
Um, well, you kind of introduced uh, the the avatar, but why don't we skip ahead to um, uh, Lud Turbo Abaddon and kind of tell us uh, a little bit more about this? Because you mentioned it's a, an avatar, but tell us about the inspiration for this exhibit, who this avatar is, and kind of uh, yeah, the what you were interrogating uh, with uh, Le Turbo Avedon. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I encountered the work of Le Turbo Avedon online as uh, is suitable for a digital presence. And I found it really interesting that uh, the character or the artist never um, shows themselves physically anywhere. So it's really only the avatar who interacts and the avatar also always changes. So Le Turbo Avedon was basically born <clears throat> in 2008 online in the uh, computer game Second Life. Some of um, our listeners might remember that. Um, it uh, turned into a capitalist trap soonish, but in the very beginning, it was really interesting and exactly this kind of an open world where everyone could look like a very crazy avatar or like an animal, or you could take any identity and just gather there and have interactions with real people all over the world represented by their avatars. It was for the time being, it was very progressive. Um, and the Turbo Avedon soon noticed that, yeah, <clears throat> creating a digital identity in different computer games or different online spaces um, really helped to find their yeah identity and, and um, idea of, of what their art should be about. And the show um, was titled Pardon Our Dust. And that's, um, if some of you remember, also this kind of signage we had in the old internet where websites were under construction and you would use like the same language you did on construction sites on in the actual physical world and now um, we are building the the new immersive web 3 um, the internet that's also coined the metaverse which will be much more spatial and which will be less like flat with browsers and clicking yes and no fields and things like that but rather walking into um, space, maybe with your own avatar, uh, maybe with your VR glasses on. So it will be a different experience of how information is being accessed. And the problem with you know, all these new building new things in online, it's always large private global corporations who will then try and use this um, for them, their own progress and profit and create kind of walled in gardens that are not open, that are not accessible or inclusive to many um, people, um, because they are for profit spaces that uh, will use data and lots um, and uh, you name it um, to make uh, yeah uh, profitable income. And the Turbo is really interested in um, having that discussion around why is there not an, a free, openly accessible internet space anymore? Kind of everything's kind of privatized. Um, it's like um, properties around lakes or on the seaside. There's hardly any space left where you can just go and enjoy what is actually a common good, a lake or the ocean. And the same is for the digital world. So if you privatize every website, every space there is, how can uh, creatives thrive? How can non-cooperative uh, entities thrive and access information? How can there be, how can there be critical uh, interaction if everything is owned by private corporations? So... This was the, the underlying uh, kind of theme of the show, but it was very beautifully and poetically woven into a six-channel installation in the Mac Gallery, uh, like a um, kind of immersive experience. We could sit down and really see um, the, the narrative unfold, um, the images unfold on these six screens with the avatars being present on smaller screens, um, narrating the story. And it, uh, yeah, it was an endless loop that was ever changing so slightly, um, showing a world that is permanently under construction, um, like construction inside forests, flooded suburb, suburban cities, um, hints towards the crypto bubble that had just recently bursted. Yeah, that's, um, some photos are um, visible online. Yeah, that's, I, I'm so sad I missed all these exhibits, uh, but it's so great to to hear about them. And um, it, it's really interesting what you're saying about the the walled gardens of the internet, because you know it seems like you know when the internet first came about, the promise of it was this more utopian uh, access to information and connectivity of 
human knowledge and humans to humans and the web 2.0 versions of the internet. But it seems like with um, the different types of metaverses or whatever people want to call it now, that they're even more um, uh, specific to the creators creating them and not interoperable. So it seems like uh, it's even more fractured versus interoperable. But with some of the the blockchain technology, it seems like we might have the wallets where our identities will carry along with us. But that, as you were saying, goes definitely against the the corporation um, aspect of it that wants to keep everyone on their platform or in their role uh, in their worlds all at the same time. So it'll be interesting to uh, see see how that plays out. Definitely. And yeah, the blockchain technology is uh, something to watch for sure. Also the concept of the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. We at the MAC are just in the progress of founding one and are uh, currently in the conceptual phase, um, looking to see how we can use this kind of yeah bottom-up decentralized community building um, as a cultural institution. Well, there was one thing in one of the interviews and uh, an article I read ahead of this interview that I thought was really interesting that you had said because um, about the difference of looking towards uh, utopian and dystopian futures, because often on the show, what's come up in conversation is like, we have so many dystopian stories out there that if that's all we like here, that's what we're going to manifest versus there's not very u- many utopian stories with AI for us to like look forward to, but you actually kind of like the dystopian. So I was wondering if you could share um, why and your reasoning behind that, because I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, for sure. So yes, I do like the dystopia as a concept, not I don't want it to happen to us. <laughs> but um, I, always, I, I always say that um, because I think utopia per se is dystopia. May not sound reasonable to yet, but let me explain. Most of um, literature and films that describe a utopian scenario are kind of creepy. So if you really look closely, this utopian world is not good. It's also a dystopia. And that's sometimes overlooked. And that has been widely discussed in literature literature critique. But um, utopia can very quickly turn. And if you take, for example, the Godard film Alpha Will, where there's a perfectly fine utopia, but for example, crying, um, poetry, and a third thing are forbidden by law. And then you see how this kind of changes society. So if you can't write a poem or cry, it's a dystopia already, right? Even though um, these instruments were brought upon this state, this fictional state, to help people not be sad and be, you know, not fight over things, but it doesn't work. So that's why I thought um, any utopia will turn into a dystopia at some point. And especially um, if you look at the AI discussion that you had brought up, um, I'm, I don't believe that AI suddenly will, uh, in the next few weeks, take over the world and produce paper clips and kill us all. But um, the scenario behind these um, uh, very drastic uh, ideas or concepts that I have been put out there by scientists is obviously how machine learning works. So it, it's not impossible that a machine will overtake something, override something, because it, it uses self-learning uh, based on data. But it's, um, that's, that's why it's so important to have this discussion, especially with artists within the avant-garde of these people who uh, look critically at what AI does. There are many great people out there in the art industry that are critical towards these technologies and show through their art pieces and installations, which helps us uh, to to have a more graspable uh, approach to to these technologies, to understand the dangers ahead. Um, And to also understand that it's us humans who, who need to do something about our kind of way that we interact with data and, and what we feed into AI. Yeah, I, I think that's so interesting. Um, so the so the utopian is still dystopian, and we're and if I understood what you said correctly, we still need to use that as kind of a, a signal of how to navigate uh, the future as kind of like just a tool to interrogate things now. 
um, which I find so fascinating. Um, well, you mentioned the artificial tears again, and um, I did hear, and I don't know if it was you who said uh, it to me or someone else recently, that every tear is actually um, almost like a snowflake uh, composed completely different. So they're all completely unique. So I thought that was uh, super fascinating too. Uh, but following um, that exhibit, the the next one that you did that kind of explored uh, AI and technology uh, was uncanny values, which I find as a as an interesting um, a thread of going to what is human to kind of uh, the symbolism and representation of human emotions through emojis. So I'll let, uh, I don't want to take, uh, steal your thunder, but tell us about uncanny values, uh, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence and in you, um, and more about this exhibit. Yeah, that was a, a really great research. I did that show together with a media theorist, um, Paul Weigelfeld. And we worked um, also with Process Studio, a graphic and interaction design studio, who we had briefed um, to develop one little thing that will be the main feature of um, the exhibition promotion. And that was AI generated emojis, um, short AI emojis or iMojis. And we thought it so interesting that we try to convey in our digital world our emotions, since we don't always FaceTime each other, so we text and then. Um, emojis were created to represent uh, a smirk or like a wink or a smiley face or a sad face. And they've ever become more intricate and there's more representations of things available now. And we thought that's such an interesting concept of how humans try to um, make an abstract little icon of their likeness, trying to convey um, a very complex thing um, that is a body language and emotional display during um, conversation. Um, and sometimes more successfully than other times in these emojis. And we thought it would be so interesting to see um, how early, um, it was in 2019, that exhibition, how early um, GAN networks, uh, machine learning concepts would uh, come up, uh, what they would come up with. And uh, yeah, the results uh, were rather disturbing, but we still used them um, for our poster campaign. And um, especially so because the title, Uncanny Values, um, also refers to a term by Masahiro Mori, um, a Japanese uh, uh, computer scientist who coined the term uncanny valley as this little dent in our trust towards human looking but not human um, creatures, such as um, yeah, puppets, masks, clowns, um, zombies, that people, body parts, prostheses, they all fall into that kind of, which gives us a little shiver because. It seems like it's us, but it's not. And that also applies to humanoid robots, androids represented in films, where you just see there's a little bit off. It's not actually human. So this kind of uncanniness, and the uncanny I have to insert here, is a term also coined by Sigmund Freud, the Viennese psychoanalyst. And it means, uh, yeah, some, the, the creepy, the, the eerie. And um, in, the, in the field of ethics around AI, we chose to have this uh, title mashed up, Uncanny Values, because also our human uh, understanding of morals, rules, and ethics is kind of uncanny at times, because it doesn't always do humanity justice, one might say. So we thought that would be an appropriate um, time to look into artworks and pieces that are critical towards the bias that is also um, coming with any data put into machine learning, right? Because we are just humans and we do make mistakes and wrong decisions. We have different sorts of political directions and governments. And then throughout history, there's a lot of data accumulated that later on proves to have been wrong, but it's still there. We did not erase it or delete it from the global storage. So it's um, still out there and machine learning algorithms still use it. And um, yeah, that can lead to uh, terrible outcomes. and. Yeah, that was a part of uh, this topic of the exhibition. Oh, for all of our uh, viewers and listeners, uh, we'll be sure to put the images on the dedicated blog post because uh, I know it's hard to to not see them and just hear about them. But they they kind of look like. Um, almost like grunge and smudged emojis with like different uh, looks to them. Uh, 
but uh, what was what was the reaction to uh, to these emojis uh, of the uh, in the exhibit? Um, yeah, um, mixed, I would say. There were many fans. We also had stickers and buttons. They're all gone. So um, uh, the fan community out there had uh, their fun. But there were also people like, what is that? Like <laughs> being horrified because, as you said, they looked a little bit like emojis being shot in the head and kind of <laughs> left there. <laughs> but others, I mean, they're different ones. Others were really cute. <laughs> yeah, interesting how, how that turned out because the concept of a little abstract icon is very hard to learn, actually, for a machine. Well, one thing that I, I find fascinating about emojis is how much thought goes into selecting them sometimes in our forms of communication and like how we want to convey a certain feeling or sentiment. And uh, for one uh, networking icebreaker, sometimes I'll ask people to uh, to share like what's your name, where you're from, what's your favorite emoji. And sometimes I get these reactions that's like so personal that people don't want to share what their favorite emoji is. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's fascinating to go from, uh, I guess, the different types of communication and uh, conveying what we're trying to feel from emoji or like text, emojis, GIFs, and now we're going to have avatars and film. It's just kind of like uh, what medium best represents what I'm trying to feel and to share that out. Um, so I think it's a, a really interesting exhibit um, from that. Uh, but one of the things part of this exhibit too, you mentioned the the bias and how mm -hmm. there's like corrupt human data. So can you uh, expand on that a little bit more for us? Like kind of what came up in your research or the exhibition related to to bias and data? Yeah, there were especially um, two, actually three works that dealt with that topic in very different ways. And one, which was our entry piece, um, which was very much conveying the uncanny valley effect was um, work by uh, Heather Dewey Hakeborg um, that is uh, that was trying to use machine learning to reconstruct how the whistleblower Chelsea E. Manning might look like based on only samples of their DNA. And this sounds very complicated, but actually there was research done that um, if you put DNA samples in, machines, I mean, machine learning uh, algorithms can, based on data of other humans and their DNA um, design, basically a phase of that's what this person with this DNA might look like to identify them, maybe yeah, crime suspects, et cetera. But um, the thing is the installation was comprised of uh, all the little uh, hanging faces of uh, a so different kind of uh, body height, skin color, uh, skin texture, hair, uh, male, female. So it was like, Okay, one DNA sample from the same person, Chelsea E. Manning, came out as the, all these figures. So it doesn't work, obviously. Um, the technology failed, but still um, it, it shows that the idea exists that we can use machine learning to um, identify suspects, for example. And there was this huge scandal actually around machine learning about crime prediction because based on data from U.S. states um, with a high prison pop, pop, uh, pop, sorry, I have to repeat that. Um, based on data from um, U.S. states with a um, high prison density and, and a population, um, there were lots of uh, people of color incarcerated for many reasons. Also, again, mistakes from the past, um, to be mentioning the war on drugs and things like that. So there's this all this data of past uh, criminals and prisoners that are of black skin color. So the machine learning algorithm inevitably will inevitably will learn from this past data and predict that crimes will be done by black people. So obviously wrong. It was a huge scandal and that this was even considered. And that's what I mean when I always say like corrupt human data, because this data is not high quality. It does not enable a machine to properly predict who's going to commit crime and who won't uh, because the whole system is, is, is kind of crazy. So um, this uh, was uh, information that Heather G. Hakeborg also considered when uh, doing that work and especially choosing Chelsea E. Manning as a central figure also to yeah uh, technology to government and political uh, related topics and also a person who is gender fluid and then changed like 
their um, their pronouns and their identity. So even more complex in looking at what the DNA comes up with. And as an installation, you will have pictures. Um, it's also made for a, yeah uncanny entrance to the topic. And uh, another work uh, or artist who is always concerned with this kind of bias and information is Trevor Peglin, um, American artist who has been become uh, known with his very radical and critical work, also investigating surveillance technology, how our data is being used, and also together with Kate Crawford has done extensive projects on AI and machine learning and how our data is being used and misused in this regard. And we showed a piece by him where he showed the like the background actually of machine learning, um, the huge image databases that are out there and are used for machine learning. One of them is called ImageNet, and um, it has photos where it's also always in discussion. It, it was ever cleared if people gave the permission to have these photos used. I don't think so. Um, there's also a project, by the way, where you can request your face being removed from any machine learning database um, by Holly Herndon. Um, but um, this showed a, a video with uh, very fast changing images from ImageNet and a very great soundtrack by aforementioned Holly Herndon, um, also uh, AI created. And it was so mesmerizing for our viewers and for us curators when we first encountered it. Uh, to see this vast amount of image information that is thrown in there and that machine algorithms can identify in the number of seconds. They can see what it is. We humans only have a blur. So that makes this kind of yeah, frightening thought of may machines maybe really uh, overtake us. But then again, we all know uh, the wonderful invention of capture the thing where you have to prove to be a human by identifying um, traffic lights. And this, um, again, proves that the machine is not so smart because they can hardly do it. Yeah, thank you for, for expanding on that. Oh, I know, uh, I feel like we're just scratching the surface and can go on and on. Uh, but I know we're coming close to time on the interview. As someone who has like thought deeply about all these subjects and done a lot of research, um, uh, on exhibitions, interrogating different subjects. What what are you currently thinking about? Like, what are you mentioned DAOs, um, but related to like AI and humanity and culture? What are some of like the current uh, questions that you're kind of marinating on or uh, related to the space? Yeah, so um, actually, the the term digital culture that has been um, woven into my job title is something that I'm currently and always expanding to think about and talk about with other people and, and creatives, because um, I think it's so interesting how culture changes through technology. And if we use the word technology, not only for digital technology here, but we have to look at technology as also electricity or agriculture, uh, all these are technologies. And then we have now very advanced digital technologies and how this has impacted the way that the world has developed or that, yeah, cultural aspects have developed. That's something that interests me always. So um, also especially to see it through the eyes of artists, designers and architects who have been deeply concerned with these topics because that's a main thing that um, I, I, I love to do when we do these kinds of exhibitions and research to invite artists and creatives to show us the world through their eyes, through their work, because it's so much different than reading an article on AI, which I always do, obviously. But or seeing an installation that has that is conveying some of these topics and research, but through you know an artistic kind of sense or a very interesting kind of spatial setting. So yeah, that's that's one thing. And also the notion of um, augmented reality is currently interesting to us um, because you can do so many things, be it in the contemporary um, context, but also concerning historical artifacts that may be too fragile to be opened or touched. You can um, do interesting things with augmented reality there and ex like extended reality. I think that's a, a great concept. And ever since it has been used in films like the Minority Report back in the day, now we actually live in a world where this is no longer sci-fi. We can actually use that. And the question will be, how will we use that? And um, in the museum context, I think AR is an interesting topic that we are currently um, looking into more. 
I know one of the the cool things about um, VR and AR and MX, mixed reality, extended reality, there's so many different names, Mm. immersive experiences, is the application of where you could go to any museum or place in the world and experience it without having to physically be there. So is that something that you all are doing or have explored at the Mac as well? Not so much, actually. I mean, I think it's... um interesting and very inclusive way to to um, include more people the world who might not be able to travel for several reasons um and i think it's a beautiful idea to to make that happen we haven't done it yet but also i have to stress that the, the physical museum visit is also um irreplaceable because not only is there textures smells we had that early in the conversation when we started with artificial tears we have this like yeah Is it warm or cooler in the exhibition space? How does the floor feel like that I walk on? And also, especially the social aspect, the presence of other people um, you might or might not have come with to the museum, maybe strangers, maybe your friends and family, that you encounter there and together you look at something and you're both interested in that thing at the same moment. And that can lead to very interesting emotions or conversations And I think we would lose that if we only do it in VR. But uh, also recently on a panel, a VR artist said, but you can also have social experiences in VR. And that is also true. So I'm very excited to see what um, the future will bring in that regard. Yeah, I I am too. I'm a big believer for as much as I live digitally, my life is online, uh, that you can't replace in-person presence. But I also know some... um, technologists are trying to recreate presence digitally, which I, I I personally don't think that we can replicate that, but I know some people are are working on that, which I, I find really interesting. Um, to your point on the digital cultures, uh, I loved how you explained that. Could you give like some examples and actually one one interview um, that hasn't been released yet, uh, I discovered um, uh, solar punk as like an interesting uh, cultural movement to kind of counter uh, cyberpunk that's more utopian. Uh, but what are some of the the digital cultural trends that you're seeing um, uh, in your conversations with the artists and stuff? Because uh, I'm really, yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, yeah, uh, as you are mentioning, solar punk, there's also one very important movement that's Afrofuturism. And that also reimagines basically the future of the African continent um, that is uh, famously being mined for all the rare minerals that we use to put in our deck. And um, the country or the the continent itself, many countries on the continent are not benefiting as much from that fact, actually. So I think that's um, an interesting turn that has come out of that. And I think maybe the most dominant one that we still experience now is um, has in the advent of the first iPhone in 2007, because um, what at first was kind of, yeah, okay, it's a smartphone, you can, it's a flat screen, it's like a little, you have it here, a little black box, but um, it's not about this surface design, which is also slick and nice, um, but it's about the interface design. And I think the term like interface has been very uh, poignant for digital culture of our time. Because the interface suddenly enables you through a device that has formerly had limited functions, such as calling someone or texting or making a photo, now is connected to the internet and enabled other platforms and applications to even come into existence. We didn't have that before. So then there was social media born. Now social media is slowly turning into social technology, which might be an interesting time to live in. And I think this kind of the way through a smartphone usage widely spread it. We changed our cultures because it's now normal that you take photos of nearly everything you see. I mean, not everyone's like that. I am like that. But um, and then you can share that immediately online, or you can live stream from anywhere you are in the world. You can have your precise location. So it it really changed the way we also interact with the physical world, and that's what I find so interesting. How it always trickles back so digital advancements don't stay in the digital realm they they trickle back into our physical reality and change the way we we go about that so um yeah that's um one interesting uh, train of events where i think um 
how will that change now that we have more natural language processing, for example, and uh, will we will we use our voice more to interact with our devices? Does everyone li- really like it? I don't as much, especially in public space. Like I would imagine it to be really weird to be speaking out loud to my devices all the time. But um, yeah, that's that's one thing that's that's trending, and I find it interesting, and it would be. Uh, great to see how our culture will change if we start, you know, talking out loud to our tech all the time. And obviously, these kind of, um, yeah, ChatGPT that uh, was mentioned earlier, these kind of technologies that would pass the so-called Turing test, and it's hard to um, to see if it's human or non-human, how that will change, for example, literature, text production, you know, can be um, interesting cultural shift. Yeah, and I think uh, another interesting thing on the um, that front is not only are we talking to devices more, but with Neuralink and the mm-hmm. brain-computer interface, I mean, the tech already exists where you can think, and then the machines will take your thoughts yeah. and turn them into images or video. So it's like talk about manifesting from thought to uh, reality in a in a digital sense. Like that tech exists, and like what's that uh, what's that going to mean for society and culture too? That is so fascinating, Helen, because that's again a dystopian sci-fi narrative right there. It may help some people, and it's being used right now. Um, in in medicine, um, but uh, just think what you can do with that that can go wrong. So it's going to be an interesting time <laughs> to experience that. Oh, it's, we're not short of interesting times at all, <laughs> <laughs> <No>. at all. <laughs> um, uh, well, for um, uh, our listeners and viewers, um, is there anything specific at the Mac that you want to promote or plug uh, current exhibitions uh, that you want to share uh, uh, with the Creativity Squared community? Um, definitely. Um, one uh, that has, uh, is no longer on view, but the website is still out there, is the new virtual.org. Um, it's a show that was concerned with uh, yeah the virtual space and how the new um, world building narratives um, can be used to create also um, tropes around ecological concerns um, in conjunction with technology, which is, also, which is also really important to think about. And the current show that's just on view um, is the solo show of Wang Ping, a Hong Kong based animation artist, um, the show is titled Edging, and it shows four short animation films that deal with many of our emotions and problems and tensions that we have in our globalized digital cultural uh, society at the moment. And um, it's really fun and um, interesting to to see those. Awesome. Well, um, I hope I can get back to uh, Vienna, uh, Vienna soon to, to see all the exhibits because I was there, I think, uh, before the, the space one. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, ended. I'm so bummed that that I missed it. Uh, but definitely anyone who's got Vienna on their travel list, add Mac uh, as a stop on that. Um, so one question that I always like to ask our guests is if you want our listeners and viewers to remember one thing or walk away from our conversation uh, with one thing, what is that uh, that you want them to, to remember? That um Design and digital culture or digital tools are always more than their surface or their, um, yeah, their, them being an object. They always have some kind of impact on the way that society changes, maybe even political changes. So um, be mindful of that and embrace it. I love that. Well, Marlies, it has been so wonderful having you on the show. Thank you for your time and sharing all the amazing projects and your thoughts and inspiration and the artists who brought them to life in your exhibitions. Thank you so much for having me on Creativity Squared, Helen. It was such an interesting conversation. And I think I have the feeling we could talk more for hours, but we will leave it at that. And have a great day. Thank you. Well, we'll definitely have to bring you back on the show because I know there's definitely a lot more to talk about. So, Would love thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you for spending some time with us today. We're just getting started and would love your support. 
Subscribe to Creativity Squared on your preferred podcast platform and leave a review. It really helps. And I'd love to hear your feedback. What topics are you thinking about and want to dive into more? I invite you to visit creativitysquared.com to let me know. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter so you can easily stay on top of all the latest news at the intersection of AI and creativity. Because it's so important to support artists, 10% of all revenue Creativity Squared generates will go to ArtsWave, a nationally recognized nonprofit that supports over 100 arts organizations. Become a premium newsletter subscriber or leave a tip on the website to support this project and ArtsWave. And premium newsletter subscribers will receive NFTs of episode cover art and more extras to say thank you for helping bring my dream to life. And a big, big thank you to everyone who's offered their time, energy, and encouragement and support so far. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. This show is produced and made possible by the team at Play Audio Agency. Until next week, keep creating.